happening in YouTube world hope everyone's having a great Saturday great weekend and uh, you know everyone's getting some training in and all that stuff doing the things that they want to do over the weekend and uh, getting outside enjoying the weather all that good stuff um, and I want to jump on here you know sometimes it's like I go through these uh, periods where I like to jump on live a lot and then other times I'm like I'm gone for you know a couple look at this guy he's little little willy worm guy Pretty cool, huh? Never know what you're gonna see out here, man, in, in the world of nature. Um, so I kind of been jumping on live a little bit more. Hopefully you guys like that. I like doing these types of like talks and stuff. These types of, uh, I got a lot of comments, especially on my last one. I usually get some good comments on these about people, you know, they like it when I jump on here and do some of my talks and go through like how my mind works and my opinions on things and, and all that stuff. And uh, sometimes, you know, it's just fun to do that. And then I get to kind of respond to your people's comments and everything. But I like doing this in more of a live setting instead of like a pre-recording. Anytime I try to do these in like a pre-recorded setting, like I got to like, I don't know, dude. It just doesn't work out for me. I just don't, I don't like the feel of it and everything, you know. It starts to get feeling more scripted and all that. So I like just to let it roll. And I usually like to be outside. I always like to be outside. I'm outside way more than I'm ever inside. And it's like... You know, when you're walking around, you get that flow, it gets the mind going and all that stuff. And I just got off of a live on the uh, Kali Center Compound Facebook group talking about this same subject. Um, but I wanted to uh, jump over here and kind of do like a summarized version of it. And it's really about how to be successful in your martial arts. Uh, whether it is, you know, you're training in martial arts, if you've got a business in martial arts, you want to teach in martial arts, whatever it is, right? And really these... Uh, these, these same points and everything, they can be applied everywhere else and everything else that you're doing. Hey, what's happening? Mikey, good to see you on here. If you guys are watching live in the comment, go ahead and just uh, put down where you're watching from. Uh, you know, what state, what country. It's always cool to uh, see where you guys are, where you guys are at. Um, it's just cool to see that. Can you do seminars in Scotland, Glasgow? Uh, I don't know, man. That's if, uh, I mean, if Scott and, uh, ever wants me to be there and wants, and wants me to, uh, to, to teach over there and stuff, I'd love to, you know, I'd love, Scotland is a place I want to visit. I got some of that Scotch Irish blood in me, so I'd love to, love to get over there and, uh, and do that. Greetings from Germany, Maryland, Maine. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. So yeah, I wanted to just kind of do a little summary of uh, what I talked about in that in my Facebook group uh, about you know be, being successful or how to be successful in uh, in your martial arts journey. And again, this can relate to everything else that you're doing. And you know, a lot of the stuff I learned just through my own experience. Uh, I wasn't really taught any of these points by anybody other than just life and experiments and uh, experience and stuff like that. Um, between uh, you know. It, Kali has all taught me parts of this, whether it was my training or the business end of things, right? Um, so uh, one of the things, you know, when it comes to like our success and our training or as a teacher, I have a lot of people that message me a lot about, you know, I want to you know, become a teacher in martial arts and, uh, you know, martial arts has really helped me in my life and I want to, you know, give back to other people and teach other people and and do all that type of stuff and which i think is great i think it's a great goal to have it's a great vision to have and i think you should go for it um i think everybody you know whatever your goals are go for it you know if you want to teach if you want to you know open up your own martial arts studio or do your own martial arts business if, however you want to do it i think you should go for it um, you should, you know, try it because you're only going to learn. Even if it fails miserably or whatever, you're only going to learn. A lot of people don't know this, especially here on Kali Center, because a lot of people, like, you know, when they start coming to the Kali Center channel now, they, they wouldn't know this. But my business, my martial arts business is my first business. And um, I've actually failed at this three times. So I've, I've gone through five renditions of my martial arts business. And I failed three times. The first three were just crash and burns. The, the fourth one was pretty good. It was uh, able to provide for me as a, as a single person. But then as my family and everything, you know, started popping out kids and stuff, um, 
I needed to revise that. So then I opened up the fifth version and uh, Collie Center has been a blessing. It's, it's been it's been working out very, very well. And honestly, it's the most fun that I've had too. Um, so, you know, how, how do you become successful in that? Number one, right, I had to first start looking at, you know, how do I train and become more successful in my training so that I felt like I had the worth to teach. Then I had to figure out how do I teach? So I need to go and spend some time learning how to teach. Then it's like, okay, now that I can, I can train, I can do, and I got some, you know, halfway decent skill. Uh, now I can teach, right? I could teach kids. I can teach. Hey man, I appreciate that. What, what is That's crazy. Thanks man. Um, but you know, I appreciate like, uh, skills and all that. I can, um, you know, I can teach kids, I can teach adults, I can teach all kinds of people. The squirrels are going crazy, man. They're getting ready for winter. They're preparing. They're all running around the treetops and trying to find their nuts and go bury their nuts and stuff. And they're planting trees and everything. Um, you know, so it was just kind of step-by-step process. Um, but what I've realized is that I use the same formula for all three steps in my martial arts journey. As a practitioner as a teacher and also, uh, in, in business stuff. So, um, I want to kind of share that with you guys. I've, uh, welcome to the world of super chat where your viewers can now donate funds directly to you. That's freaking awesome, man. I appreciate that. I, I always, you know, I saw that stuff on the YouTube stuff, you know, cause when you have your YouTube channel, you go back and the whole thing and there's like the whole monetization stuff like, you know, area. I always saw the super chat area stuff, but, uh, I, I never really gave that any attention or thought. Um, but that's really cool, man. I, I appreciate that a lot. Um, Hey man, if everybody wants to give me some super chats, I would be very grateful for that. <laughs> um, dang, maybe I'll do lives more often if you guys super chat me. <laughs> then that, that'll, that'll help pay for my, my kid's college. <laughs> or at least, you know, for his first tractor, the new tractor here. <laughs> I don't know. But I really appreciate that. Thank you very much for that. Um, but yeah, what I realized is that I was using this exact same kind of formula um, for everything I do. And I use it even today when I get into other business ventures. So I have a few other business ventures. Um, yeah, check out the snake skin. I always see cool stuff out here. I, I always do a morning walk and everything, you know. I like getting a workout in real early in the morning. A little bit of training. I did that real early today. And then uh, I like to just kind of walk around and, you know, do uh, just kind of see what's going on around everywhere. So, And when I do these morning walks, sometimes I do the walks in the evenings. just depends on how my day is. Um, that's a good time to jump on live and everything. So kind of... Like the old saying, kill two birds with, with one stone. Uh, if I can get the whole flock with one stone, that would be even better, right? So, um, yeah, I want to share these little points with you because wherever you are in your martial arts uh, journey and you know whatever goals it is that you have for your own, you know maybe these things will help you out as well. They've helped me out. They've helped a lot of other people out, you know, a lot of my staff guys, um, they're using these points too, and it's, it's really working. So I'll give you guys quite a few things. Um, number one, so I also wanna make sure you guys, as we're going through these points, I'm also gonna out, point out the number one thing that I have observed that kills people's success. It completely just knocks it off. And then they're like, they're, they're done. And it's just gonna be really, really hard for them. They're not done. I mean, they can get back on it, but it's really, really difficult. So the, the first thing is uh, identifying what success is to you. That's number one. So even in your training, right? You guys will hear me put these questions out. If you've been following me for a while and you've seen some of my lives, then you've probably seen me talk about this, where I always ask these two questions, right? What's your purpose for training? And then what do you want from your training? Those are two different questions. They seem like they're the same. They're very similar to each other, but they support each other. So What's your purpose for training? And what do you want from your training? This is gonna help to identify what's your focus. Where should you drive your focus? All right, and then that's gonna help where to put your effort. And then that's gonna enable you to stay more persistent in your training. And if you're not uh, persistent in your training, well then, 
you know, everything else is kind of, well, pointless, right? It ends up being like, well, did you just waste your time then? What did you really get out of it? Time is a big value to me. I got like spider webs and stuff on me. But time is a big value to me. I, I value time like a currency. The only difference is I can make more money. I can't make more time. So, uh, you know, and I, I know how much money I have in my bank account. And I know I can put more in there. I don't know how much time I have in my time bank account. And I, I, can't, I can't put more in there, right? So I guess I can make a decision that would be a, a full withdrawal. <laughs> but, you know, that wouldn't be so smart, right? Um, so the first thing is we have to identify what, what is success to us. And as martial artists, this is really important because everybody has a different purpose for training. Everybody has a different want, what they want out of their training, right? Everyone's got a different reason for training. Some people it might be self-defense. Other people, you know, it might be like fitness and health. It might be a, a mental wellness. Uh, maybe it's because they're trying to figure out how to navigate the business world. So, and they're using martial arts to help them strategize and better negotiate tactics in the business world. Like I have people that train with me that are business owners and they use the, these principles of Kali and, and strategies and tactics in their business, right? They, they find ways to use it, right? Offense, counter offense, recounter the counter, understanding quartering, requartering, counter quartering, right? All of these principles that are really universal principles understanding tempo, range, timing, all this stuff could be applied in the business world, right? So I do have actually a lot of business people, a lot of entrepreneurs, people that own businesses that train under me, that train with me. So they like a lot of lessons for those reasons. Um, and uh, some people, you know, there it could be multiple reasons too. Some people are training, most of the people that train with me personally most of them are training because they're training for a fitness and wellness purpose. And they're also training because of a, of a mental sharpness, right? They want some kind of mental sharpness, whether that's, again, a lot of it's going to be towards the business world because I do have a lot of entrepreneurs that train with me. Um, so, uh, you know, there's different, there could be multiple reasons why you train, but you want to identify what is your success. What does that mean to you and what does that look like to you? And, you know, does that mean like if you're training Kali, is that performance in your footwork? Is that performance in, you know, the flow of the weapon? Is that performance in the sparring? Is that performance in the understanding the knowledge? Is it the whole gamut? But then that's what it is. So why is that important, right? You got to identify and, and define what your success is. And it could be anything. There's no wrong answer to that. And it could change as you evolve in, you know, in your journey, your answers to all these questions and things could evolve as well. So that's number one, identify your success and get it down to the detail, right? Write it down, make a private video for yourself talking about it and go back and review your notes from time to time and then make any corrections that you need to and uh, do that. So we're going to come back around to these things. But uh, that's number one. Number two is work ethic. Define a very strong work ethic and, uh, and do that thing. So my training, my, my focus for training has changed over time. And over time, you know, back in my, well, teens and 20s. Well, in my teens, I was, when I started, when I first so let me go way back. I'll go all the way back. When I started martial arts, I was six years old and it was through a martial art at the time called Budo Aikido. They changed the name to Budo Taijutsu and it was in the park district of the town that I grew up in. And, uh, you know, so that's not like, like crazy martial arts or anything, but it was, it was awesome. You know, we're doing forms, we're doing these techniques, you know, how to escape bear hugs and choke holds and all that stuff. And it was a lot, a lot of fun because at the time, my focus was I just wanted to be as close to a, to a Ninja Turtle as I possibly can be. You know, like I love the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I thought they were the coolest, you know, best thing in the world. And I wanted to be just like that. And that's why I trained in martial arts. And then I got into Taekwondo because I wanted to start doing like board breaking and sparring and tournaments and, and stuff like that, right? 
um, just that kind of like next level of intensity. So in my teen years, um, when I was 15, I was introduced to Filipino martial arts and those teachers called it Escrima. And, uh, at the time it was just, it was just cool, man. Like I just liked martial arts just for the movement and the practice of martial arts. You know, I carried a knife with me and I realized I didn't really know how to use the knife. You know, I grew up, uh, half of my life, I grew up in the country and the other half I grew, uh, I spent in the city. Um, you know, I grew up and went to school in Chicago and then my grandfather, he had a farm out in the central Wisconsin. I had family where I am now. I have family in, in West Virginia. And so I spent the other half of my time running around in the woods, hunting, fishing, doing all that stuff. And, um, so, you know, I, I knew how to... You know, I, I can skin some animals and flay some fish with a knife, but I didn't know, you know, the city life need for it, right? The self-defense for it. So I then started realizing that my knife that I was carrying with me was more of a liability than an asset. I can come back around to that too, because I feel that way about it now as well. Um, even though it's an asset to protect my life, but it's still a liability in other ways. Um... So, yeah, so that's, uh, you know, that's what I was doing as a teen. And then in my 20s, it was all about fighting, dude. I just wanted to fight. I wanted to spar with everybody. I talked about this on my last YouTube live. You can go back and check that out if you want. Um, but that's what it was all about. And now I've transitioned to a whole nother purpose. And my whole point here is to give you guys examples of how this can, uh, how this can change, right? How your purpose for training and your reasons for training can evolve. And, and as they should, especially as you get older different things in your life become priorities, right? Your priorities change and stuff like that. And like my whole purpose right now is longevity. And, you know, I want longevity with my time, meaning everyday time. So, you know, I have redefined what my success looks like in my training over and over and over and over again. At one time, it was all about trying to be as good as Leonardo and Raphael Another time it was just to be able to get in, get in the rounds with the biggest, baddest, most intimidating people that, that I knew that were in my, in my classes. And, uh, at other times it was to improve my fitness and my health and my athletics so I could perform. And now it's really about longevity. And I enjoy the chess game of the Kali that we do here at Kali Center. Right? I enjoy it because of, because of the way it makes me think, uh, the way it makes me reflect on things. You know, you got to be able to see tactics and negotiate and renegotiate. And uh, maybe that's a little bit of, of my, my business life coming out where I, I love the world of negotiation. And, um, you know, to me, that's, uh, that's, it, it's a lot of fun. And I've met a lot of great people and I, I've established a lot of good relationships through, through some tough negotiations with some people and, uh, you know, some pretty, pretty heated stuff. But uh, it's, it's, you know, sometimes you make some great relationships that way. And, um, you know, it's kind of like in martial arts, you know, you have a good sparring round, you beat the crap out of each other and then you become friends, you know, and you're like, hey, man, let's go, let's go chill and all that. Kind of the same thing. So, uh, over the time, my definition of success has changed. So don't be afraid that, you know, your definition might change as well. And that's totally cool. That's just part of the process, but you do want to have a clear definition, right? What's your purpose for training? What you want from your training? What does, what does the success look like when you achieve it? So that's number one. Number two is, a, is the work ethic. You got to have a strong work ethic. You know, I train every day. I make sure that I spend time training and what am I training for, right? I mean, primarily I'm training to improve my performance in Kali because I believe that will overall improve my performance in my day-to-day -day activities and tasks um, and that will help to enhance my longevity. So I want longevity because having a family, uh, you know, when I started Kali Center six years ago, um, you know, that's when, uh, you know, Christy was pregnant. And then before that, when it was RFA and all that, I mean, I never even thought about it. You know, it's just, I was just living life. Um, 
So priorities have changed. I, I don't care about fighting anymore. That's not why I train. That's not what drives my, my training ethic, my work ethic and my training. So, uh, you know, but having that good work ethic, what defines a good work ethic? Like, how do you know what is a good work ethic? And it really comes down to, you guys will sometimes hear me call this my formula to greatness. Maybe it's really the formula to strong work ethic. But number one is focus. You got to make sure you have good, strong focus. Unbreakable focus. You know, and that doesn't mean, you know, don't take a break from time to time. You got to take a break, recharge, refuel, you know, recover, all that stuff. Um, but when it's time to work, when it's time to train, when it's time to teach, man, you got, you, you got to be fully 100% focused and committed to that focus. You know, um, as much as it's really hard to do it, but, you know, you, you don't want to make a mistake, Right? Especially when you're teaching other people. You don't want to make, you don't want to make a teaching mistake. Um, I mean, it happens, but, you know, you don't, you don't want to. So you want to have the best focus you possibly can have. And focus is a skill. Right? you got to train your focus, and that's something that martial arts helps you to do. you got to train your focus. Don't jump around too fast from drill to drill. Spend some time. Really get it down. Understand what it is that you're doing. Understand what the drill is teaching you and what it's supposed to be teaching you. Um, you know, and that's really important. So you have that focus. Focus is really important because then you know exactly where, when, and how to drive your focus, uh, your, your effort, right? The physical effort, the actual physical doing of the thing. Um, you know, this is, we live in the third dimensional world. So this is, this is a world of the physical world. It, this life is a physical requirement, so as great as our minds are, if you don't physically do the task or at least have someone physically do the task for you, uh, then it's just nothing's going to get done. So we need to drive actual physical effort, but you need to have that focus so that way you know where you're putting your effort. One of the things in martial arts as a teacher for, gosh, 13, 14 years now that I've been a teacher, uh, one of the things that I see most common is that people are trying to do way too many things in like the shortest amount of time possible. They're studying this, they're studying that, they're doing a little bit of this, they're doing a little bit of that. And though you can gain a lot of great knowledge that way, you do start lacking in the understanding of that knowledge and then the development of the ingenuity of that knowledge because you're constantly jumping around from one thing to the next. And uh, you know, you're not giving one thing enough focus and enough time. This is why, you know, people, I mean, their mechanics are not good. Their coordination is, is not the greatest. Uh, they're not calibrated in the world of Kali, weapon to footwork, you know. And, uh, you know, you can get to that point where you're performing at a decency, but what happens when you want to get out of that decency and you're like, it's time, it's time to train with high performers? Um... So you're going you're gonna to need to put that focus and that effort somewhere. You got to drive that somewhere. Especially if you want to be a great teacher, right? Or you want to create martial arts into a business and have it to be a successful business, right? Like, I know a lot of people that have businesses, but their businesses aren't really businesses. They don't provide any kind of economics. And so it's really not a business. It's, it's a hobby. Um, it's just a hobby that maybe makes a little bit. Of money but that doesn't really do anything um and you know that all comes down to what you want your you know your martial arts business or what you know the size you want it to be and how you want to run it and all that stuff too again it comes down to whatever your definition of success is um but i gotta play that to what my definition of success is and you don't have to agree with that or what um but you got to have focus and effort that's develops the work ethic the third part of the work ethic is persistence the days you don't want to train are the most important days that you train. Um, you know, like the weather you don't want to train in is the most important weather that you get out and train in. You don't like it hot and humid, you got to go train in some hot and humid. If you want to be great at what it is that you do, then you got to go do that, right? You can't have those things end up becoming an excuse, you know, if, if you, uh, whatever you want to accomplish out of that. So persistence is, is really, really important. 
And that doesn't mean you can't, you know, take your recovery time and your breaks and stuff like that. You can do that. But you got to make sure that there are times that you are doing the thing at the moments that you really don't feel like doing the thing. Um, people ask me all the time if I ever get bored with, you know, teaching and training the, you know, day one fundamentals. And I'm like, nope. Don't get bored anymore, man. I have been so bored that I have gone beyond bored. And I'm like, if you're bored, that just means you haven't done it enough. Um, when you do it enough, you'll never get bored. It never happens. It's not even a thing anymore. So that's persistence, man. That's persistence. You know, it's like on the business side of things, because I'm going to jump around because people have different, uh, you know, practitioner, teacher, and, 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 you know, martial arts business and all that. So I'm going to jump around a little bit from those things. Um, but on the business side of things, you know, persistency, you know, it, it gets pretty boring and it gets pretty demoralizing when your business is not financially doing well. And, uh, you know, it's very easy to start looking around at other options and, uh, and come to the conclusion of quitting. That's like, I know a lot of people that, you know, they were opening up their schools and they had their schools going and they were teaching what they love to teach. And then something happened and, you know, it, it wasn't a trend or whatever. And they started integrating all these other programs and things in their martial arts school. And they ended up kind of burning out. They, they lost, they lost the thing because they weren't, they weren't putting the time into the love that they had. Right. Like, I mean, that, that happens, especially in the world of Kali, because Kali is, Kali's hard, you know, and, and I'm trying, I'm trying my best to make it easier for those that want to teach Kali and, uh, you know, either make a, make a career out of it or at least, you know, some kind of nice part-time supplemental income add on to the discretionary income or help pay some bills or whatever it is like that. You know, I'm trying to do what I can to make it easier. That's why I have the YouTube channel and, and, and all that stuff. You know, I'm promoting Filipino martial arts because it's, it's getting bigger. It's becoming more well-known, but it's, you know, not like Taekwondo or karate or Kung Fu or MMA or, you know, anything like that. I believe it has the potential to be at that degree, but it takes time and it takes people that are, are willing to, uh, go through the sacrifices of the likes of the other, you know, trolls and haters and stuff in order to make that happen, right? A pioneer has to blaze the trail before anyone else can, uh, can enjoy the trail, right? And walk with pleasure and leisure. So hopefully I'm doing my job of, you know, doing it well at blazing the trail for all those that want to, uh, you know, have a successful career at teaching in Filipino martial arts. And to the point where you don't really have to, you know, maybe have another job and do this on the side or something like that. So work ethic, right? Focus, effort, and persistence. Critical. Number three, number three, never, never quit. Never quit. This is the number one reason I see and I have observed and watched many, many people lose out on the success that they could have had is because they quit. And most people quit. Most people that are really, really good, really good, they have so much potential of really achieving great things in their martial art. Most people quit right before, right before the finish line, right before that line of success, right? I like to, I like saying that, you know, they, they quit a quarter mile from success, right? Because like on average and most statistics, people that are lost, they get lost in the wilderness and then their bodies are discovered. A lot of times you'll be surprised how many times that those, their bodies were discovered a quarter mile away from the road or a quarter mile away from help. 
And it's like if they could have just held on a little bit longer, even a lot of them were even facing in the correct direction that if they just kept going straight in a quarter mile, you guys, every, everything could have been different for them. You know, they could have still had their life. And um, this, I, that's why I like using that analogy because I've seen this happen literally in that way time and time again in martial arts on all three aspects. On the practitioner side, on the teaching side, and also on the uh, business career side of it. And uh, I'll give you guys a couple quick examples right now. Um, there was this guy that uh, when, I was, when I was training and teaching over at Elite Defense Systems in Chicagoland, we had two locations. Matt had two locations. There was one in Chicago, in the Chicago suburbs, and there was another one in Rockford, which is the other city like an hour away or an hour and a half away from, uh, from Chicago to the West. And there was a guy that was, this guy was uh, an assistant instructor at the Rockford location. And I was assistant instructor at the Bloomingdale location, the Chicago location. And, uh, you know, it takes about three to five years to go through his program at that time, you know, to then test and qualify for your black shirt, for your instructorship through him. And so this guy put in, I think he was somewhere around four, four and a half years at this point. And he had one evolution to go, right? One test to go. And he was, we were like five weeks out, six weeks out from that test. And uh, I remember him talking about how, you know, this was his goal, man. This is, this is, this meant everything to him to achieve that black shirt. He wanted to teach. He wanted to make a career out of it. One day open up his own school. He wanted to do all these things. And um, he, uh, he decided, well, when he met this girl, he decided not to do it anymore. He quit. She became his world and all this stuff, right? Five to six weeks away from achieving that, that success. And um, that's really sad, man, because he was really good. He was a good teacher and he, he, he could have done it. He could have done it. And then years later, I found out that the girl ended up dumping him like a couple months after all that stuff. You know, and that's just a really good uh, example of somebody that was literally a quarter mile away, man. You know, a quarter mile away from achieving, you know, his idea of success. And he, uh, he got distracted by something else. He allowed something else to come into the in, in the way. And uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna reply to your comment here about brain injuries and medical issues here in in, in a in a moment. So I'll get to these comments. And um, but yeah, it's a uh, it's just sad. So I've seen a lot of examples like that on all on all three aspects, right? All three aspects. You know, some people lost their martial arts business. And it's like, dude, you know, you just, you didn't, you didn't go learn business. You know, if you learned business, then, you know, you, you'd be able to, you'd, you'd be thriving, you know, you'd still be going. You know, I was at that point in my martial arts career, I was at a point where I had to make a decision. Do I hold on to the business or do I let it go and pay my bills this month? You know, I had to make that decision and I decided, well, my bills are always going to be there. And if I don't have my business, if I let go of my business, I can pay my bills this month, but then what do I do next month? So I'm like, well, I can hang on to my business, say the hell with my bills for this month. And I have a whole nother month to try to figure it out. A whole nother, you know, 28 to 31 days. You know, otherwise I just pay all my bills in one day and then that's it, right? And then I got to refigure out my entire life again in 28 to 31 days. And then that's how you can fall into some other, other issues in your life. And you start losing track of yourself and then all that. So I decided this, you know, let me just hang on to my business. And, you know, it took me months, months, man. I, uh... You know, I, I went through the whole thing, getting sent to collections and and all that stuff. So, but I 
eventually figured out how to start, you know, doing my business and getting it to work. And then I could pay my bills down and, and do all that. But if I would have gave up, if I would have gave up really early on like that, um, guys, I wouldn't be doing this today. I tell you that I'd be doing something else. I have some haters that are probably like, yeah, it would have been better that way. <laughs> no, it wouldn't have been because then you don't have me to hate on. I wouldn't be the highlight of their uh, of their day. You know, they'd have to go troll somebody else, man. I, I want people, I want the trolls, I want my trolls to be trolling me. I don't want my trolls to be trolling somebody else. They got to troll me, man. I want my trolls, man. Come on. That's important. I enjoy it. It's kind of fun. So, you know, that, that's just kind of the, the things. If you're following those three things, for me, this has helped. This has worked for me. And, uh, you know, I share a lot of this stuff with my staff guys here at Collie Center, Tom and Ollie and all them. You know, Ollie and I are partnered in a couple businesses. And, you know, they do very, you know, they do well and things like that. And, and Tom is, is building certain, you know, his things. And Tom is doing well. You know, he's doing better than he's ever done before. You know, we're all your trolls. Hell yeah, man. I'm going to have an army of trolls, man. Then they have like a troll movie or something like that. But yeah, dude, we'll, we'll be like an army. We'll go conquer the world. <laughs> but yeah, those are, the, my, uh, those are my three, I guess, tips or points or formulas or whatever you want to call it in order to, uh, you know, make sure that you are maintaining your success in your training, in your teaching in your martial arts business or whatever your goals are that you want to achieve for yourself. Uh, th those are my tips. Number one is I'll just kind of recap them real quick. Number one is define your success. So you know what your success looks like. That's really important. So that way you can define how you're going to navigate your work ethic, right? How are you going to navigate your success? Where are you going to, uh, your uh, focus, where are you going to put it? Focus is really important. That moves us into work ethic, which is number two, define your success. So you know what your work ethic needs to be. You know, maybe you don't need to be uh, putting in, you know, 20 hours a day, six, seven days a week, like I did in the beginning of my business. Maybe you don't need to do that, you know. It just kind of depends on, uh, you know, what, what your definition of success is and, and what you need it to be or what you want it to be. So work ethic is number two because work ethic is, is your focus, your effort, and your persistence, you know. You got to know where you're putting your, your focus so you know where to drive your effort and uh, maintain your persistence on those things. Maintain your practice. And then uh, number three is an indefinite commitment or dedication. Do not quit. Do not quit. You know, uh, on your goal or whatever it is, right? Most, most, most important things. I'm going to go through some of these comments because I have some people, I see some people trying to rebuttal me on this stuff. All right, let's see here. Welcome to the world of Super Chat. Oh, yeah, I read that one. Yeah, dude, I think that was awesome, man. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, the person that, that super chatted me, man. I appreciate that. That does actually help. That does help. You know, it's like when we're filming videos and stuff, you know, equipment gets broken and all that, and, and it, it costs money to make these videos all the time, you know. It's, uh, I, I do appreciate that. Does Kali have softness? Like, for example, Wing Chun has softness. Chi Sao. Um, so the way I like to define Kali in the terms of a hard or a soft style of martial art is that Kali is a necessary martial art. So if you need to be hard or you need to kind of be soft or you're kind of going with the flow in that realm, Kali has it. And it's really about being able to negotiate what you need at that specific time based on, you know, the situation at hand. So Kali is neither a hard style or a soft style. It is a necessary style. What is necessary? Your martial art videos is always great. Give up the good work. Thank you, man. Thank you. I hope you're at, you know, you're going through those drills and trying them out and, and having fun experimenting with uh, some of those drills and stuff. How do I go about training in Kali as a beginner to an advanced level so that I can cover self-defense for myself and teach others? Progressively, man, step by step. It's a long journey. Um, the thing about functionality in martial arts is that just because a martial art is labeled being a functional martial art doesn't default that you will be functional with that martial art. So you got to do a lot of training. Uh, there's a lot of solo training. There's a lot of partner time training. 
you know, you, you got to go through the process and you got to go through the process of being a beginner and going through your evolution of beginner to intermediate and to advanced because there's, there's important things that happens at each one of those, uh, you know, those placements, each one of those points in time. Uh, the other thing that I would suggest, especially in the world of Kali, is make sure you're doing your fitness training. You got to be able to do your pull-ups. You got to do your push-ups. You got to do your core exercises. And, you know, this is, this is only advised according to how we train here at Kali Center. And a lot of our training is really honestly based on endurance physically and mentally and how fast you can negotiate and renegotiate tactics. So, um... You know, there's times like when Tom and I are out here training, I mean, we're flowing literally for six to eight hours straight, no break. So endurance is very important and doing your push-ups and doing your pull-ups and, you know, you got to build that muscular strength and then you focus on that muscular endurance, you know? So, um, that's how you just, you just got to get started, man. You know, get, start doing the footwork drills Start developing your uh, striking mechanics and your coordination, and uh, you just you just got to do it, man. You got to start now. That's that's how you do it. The only thing I don't like about YouTube is that when a new comment comes in, it bumps this thing all the way down to the bottom. All right. Hey, bro, would you be open to an interview on my channel? Yeah, dude. Uh, yeah, message me or go to colliecenter.com and send me an email on my email form. If you have messaged me already or you have emailed me already, I might just not have gotten to uh, responding to it yet. But yeah, dude, we, we can set that up. We could definitely set that up. From California, nice. I wish I could afford to go back to BJJ. So make that a goal, man. Make that, you know, how can you, uh, how can you get some uh, supplementary income to, uh, to make that happen. Or maybe there's some kind of uh, exchange, some kind of barter system you can do for, uh, for a BJJ, you know, black belt instructor or something like that. Maybe you can help them out around the school. You know, you got to figure out how do you negotiate that so you can get back in the door. My pride to study Kali and all of FMA. All, oh, that's good, man. That's ambitious. Morning from Arizona. I love Arizona. One day I'm going to have property in Arizona. Uh, let's see. When I train too much, the bumpy part below the pinky hurts a lot and swell up. I'd have to see your mechanics. You might, you might be doing something wrong. I don't know. Could be a genetic thing, but it, mm, probably more likely a, a mechanical thing. What do you think about Muay Thai? I think it's awesome. Does Kali have softness? Oh yeah, I already answered that. Thanks for the videos, man. Praying for you during these crazy times. Stay safe, God bless. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. We're doing very, very well here. Good night from Indonesia. Yeah, it's so crazy, man. These different like time zones and stuff. I try to do these lives at like different time zones so people can catch them at different times. 1 11 a.m. here in the Philippines. Nice. It's like 11 o'clock in the morning, you know, almost afternoon here. Pathfinders do not follow footsteps. The narrow path only has room for one. Yeah, Ollie and I experienced that in the Badlands when we were hiking on the goat paths. That was that was an interesting time. I've lived by this my whole life. Dog, your channel has helped me out so much with the two sword system. Eskrima is a good base. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. I'm glad that we can uh, help you out in that and you're Double sword work. There is no quit. Try having a brain injury and working every day to walk in a straight line and put three words together. There's no quit. So, right. Like injuries are, uh, you know, medical conditions. That, that would be even more of a reason not to quit, you know. Like, yeah, that's not a rebuttal. I kind of skimmed that really quickly when I, uh, when I, when I saw that pop up. That was like right around the time when I was talking about like, you know, don't, don't quit when you're a quarter mile away from your success, you know? But yeah, dude, that's, that's absolutely true though. You can't, you can't, you can't give up. Otherwise you're just, you know, you're just going to fall apart more and all that, you know, don't give up to that. 
you know, just keep keep going, man, until you can't anymore. You know, but, um, you know, you got to go through your process. If you have an injury or something like that, that, that happens, some kind of medical, you know, condition that happens, you know, then you, know, you just, you just fine tune your, your definition of success. Maybe you need to evolve that, you know, maybe you need to, uh, kind of re rework and rearrange what your goals are. You know, you might have to change that. You, you have an evolution in your life, right? There was a, there was a continued change. So you, you got to work through that, man. I guarantee you, all of us in martial arts have brain injuries. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Kali heals the brain. I work with Guru Paul Mc <laughs> you know, there's a big study on that, and, and and one of the one of the big reasons why it uh, is really good for cognitive brain function, why Kali is really good for cognitive brain function, is because we're working on so many diagonals. So if if like even with kids and stuff, because there's been studies on this stuff that has been done. Um, kids that are looking through diagonal lines tend to become smarter, more intelligent, faster learners than kids that are constantly looking through horizontal and vertical lines. So in Kali, we're constantly looking at 45 degrees, which is the diagonal split between zero and 90 degrees, right? So it's, yeah, I mean, that's kind of what it is. That's, I mean, that's, that's why it works. There's a lot of like memory retention and stuff like that when it comes to Kali and a lot of other martial arts. But a lot of it too is because we are working with weaponry right from the get-go. So it just kind of turbocharges a lot of that development. Uh, and, you know, at Corto, right, at Corto range, Corto range, you know, close quarters, uh, you know, it's all close quarter combat. People don't even know what actually defines close quarter combat. But um, especially combat instructors and stuff like that, they don't even know why it's called close quarter combat. But... Um, you know, there, there's actual like math to it. <laughs> there's, there's an actual reason why it's called close quarters. But um, at short range, right, diagonals out leverage, right? They, they out leverage other diagonals, horizontals and verticals. So in Kali, we're constantly using diagonal strikes. Kali demands coordination and sharpens your response coordination. I can see how it would help the brain recover. Yeah, it does. It does demand it. Um, yeah, so make sure that coordination is a uh, is a good focus. Make sure that's a focus in your in your Kali development, as it should be with any martial arts or any physical uh, physical fitness activity. It's like in the gym, right? Focus on form, man. Have good form because then you're, you're going to get better results and you'll get faster results. Glad I found this stuff. Thanks for teaching. Yeah, man. Thank you. Thanks for being here. It wouldn't mean anything without you guys, you know, listening and, and then applying and, and all that stuff. So, Kali fixed my back and knees. It's great. Yeah, we have a lot of people that um, come to us with uh, different body element, body conditions and stuff like that. Uh, shoulder problems, especially if they played football and stuff all through, you know, high school and college and things. Um, knees, a lot of knees. And uh, we actually help a lot of people through that stuff. You know, I helped Tom out when he had, when he broke his ankle skateboarding, he 270'd his ankle and, uh, his physical therapist, he was, he was Filipino, kind of weird, right? Um, but his physical therapist was like, you know, you might, you might have maybe a 50% mobility recovery after we're done with all the PT. And, uh, so Tom was like, what do I do? That's not acceptable. I'm like, I'll give you some stuff to do, man. So we worked on Kali stuff and his footwork and all that. And uh, it was a bad break, and he's got about 95% mobility back in his ankle. Something that I believe only Kali could have done. So while his PT, his professional, the guy that went to school for this stuff, the guy that spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on his education, told him that he's probably maybe luckily going to get 50% mobility back in his ankle. Kali gave him 95% back. Now, I'm not a medical professional or anything like that. I just, I do my Kali, so... 
You should do live more often. I'm planning on it. I'm gonna. I'm doing some more training and all that stuff live and everything like that. Sometimes it's just hard to kind of put it in my schedule. That's why I wanted to do some scheduled lives and stuff like that, but it's hard because I got so much other stuff I got to do and that's going on. So I'm 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 trying to trying to fit it into my schedule. What's the difference between Kali and Salat? Two different cultures. Kali builds a strong cognitive cognitive wheel. Kali puts more spokes on the wheel, more connections and cognitive functions. <laughs> That's debatable there. If I spoke gets if a spoke gets cut, you have many paths to work back to cognitive function. There's only eight cognitive functions, so you don't you can't get more of them. There's only eight cognitive functions. Scientifically, there's only eight. So you can't uh you know, and that's your cognitive functions and your order of cognitive functions are based on your personality traits. So your primary to your, you know, your, your superior functions, to your inferior functions, your default functions, to your shadow functions. Um, every, everybody actually has all eight cognitive functions that are operating, but it, you know, people just, they, depending on your default personality is going to depend on which cognitive functions, your superiority ones, your, you know, superiority cognitive functions that you have been actually exercising in an unconscious, you know, or in conscious kind of way, uh, which is the vast majority of people. Um, so there's only eight cognitive functions. You can't actually get more because there's only eight that actually exist. So I'm sure you can come up and put all these other spiels to it and all that stuff, but uh, you don't get more. But you can exercise each one of them and get them stronger. That you can do. You know, so, um, but can you develop more connections? Yes, you can develop like more neuron connections and all that stuff. So, yeah. And it, it, and it's all dependent on how you, you know, how those neurons and stuff fire and, and all that stuff. It gets really crazy. You got to get into all the brain stuff at that point. Like, but yeah, it's, it, it's a big thing. Is it possible to practice more than one martial art? Yeah, people do it all the time. People do it all the time. Um, you know, I did, I mean, I, I, when I was in my JKD days, shit, man, I was doing JKD, I was doing boxing, I was doing a little bit of Savat, I was doing some BJJ, I was doing some Pankration, I was doing, uh, a little bit of Muay Thai stuff here and there, you know, if you're in JKD, then, you know, you're gonna come across all that, um, you know, I did a lot of that. Now, I didn't, I wasn't able to focus on one to the point, like, I do Kali, so I wasn't, like, ever going to um get to that point where i'd be as proficient in it in a knowledge understanding and ingenuity like kali um but you can it, again it goes back to what your goals and what's your definition of success did you ever have a go at foil saber fencing yes yeah i trained some fencing uh saber is my favorite uh, I like Epe a lot because, you know, you, you got the whole body as a target. So it's a little bit more of a chess game. I mean, sometimes you put the limitations like a foil and it, it's a different type of chess game. But Saber was my favorite. I like Saber the most. Um, you know, my focus on those things, you know, at the time when I was investigating some of the fencing and all that, it wasn't really like, you know, to be a fencer. A lot of my training always came back to the world of Kali. And I would start investigating these other martial arts so that I can find ways to improve my Kali and uh, find the similarities between Kali and all these other martial arts. Like, I don't care about the differences of martial arts. I I'm more interested in the similarities between martial arts. Yeah, there's a lot of good stuff over there, man. Greetings from South Carolina. That's another beautiful state, man. I, I love that place. If we didn't have to stay in this state, South Carolina was, was the number one state we were looking at moving to. Maybe one day I will. Deep into the mountains. No, you can use a wheel. A wheel is not a bad example. It's just how... It's just putting like more spokes into it 
you know, you don't necessarily want to always put more spokes into it. Because then you're adding weight. So you, you might start, you know, losing certain other qualities and performance and, and things like that. So, you know, you don't want to change the dynamics of, of the performance of the wheel. You know. Dang, dude. That's a that's a mega super uh, super comment. I appreciate that a hundred thousand times, man. Awesome, thank you for the, for that super chat. That's freaking awesome. Man, I should do I should be doing these lives more often. Hey guys, if I do if I do more lives and I do uh, like some training lives and all that, will you guys do more super chats? <laughs> that's awesome. I appreciate that, dude. Like that's that's incredible. Kali improved my other martial arts instead of the other way around. Um, for me personally, yes. But the other way around has still worked for me as well. Um, like obviously my time that I did spend in BJJ and Pencreation and, and all that has greatly enhanced the Dumog that we do here. I would say that Dumog is not the best grappling art. Um, like judo is far more superior at throws and taking people down than, than Dumog, I would say. Uh, just because in Kali, it's just so vast. I don't, I mean, I don't personally know anybody that just focused on Dumog. I mean, maybe there's people out there that have, I don't know them. I haven't met them. Um, you know, and then there's different ideas of what Dumog is, right? So, uh, that's the hard thing about Filipino martial arts guys is that there's, there's a thousand different styles and forms and all these systems and all this stuff. I mean, you don't really know what Filipino martial arts is. It's not like FMA is not like boxing, right? You can go anywhere in the world. You can go to a boxing gym and you can work out, right? Like everybody has a defined of what boxing is. Jab, cross, hook, uppercut, overhand, right? That's, that's the world of boxing. You know, BJJ, you know, you can pretty, you can go to any gym and you can roll, right? You don't have to learn a whole another new system. Maybe there's a different etiquette at that gym or something like that. Different testing record, you know, requirements and things like that. But you know, the arm bar is an arm bar. But in my experience through FMA, there's different ways and different coordinations and mechanics to strike an angle one, right? There's different, there's different numbering patterns for teaching. And some places this is an angle two, and other places that's an angle four. And this is, you know, so it's you know, it's really hard to define other than cultural. It's really hard to define what Filipino martial arts even is, right? You can't really define that other than a culture. BJJ or judo or boxing or fencing um, or like Aikido and stuff like you can define these as martial arts beyond just culture, right? You can't, you can't do that with Filipino martial arts. So for, for me, um, a lot, like my boxing, my boxing coach very, very much improved my empty hands in, in my, uh, Filipino martial arts. You know, um, I remember one of my teachers in the back was, you know, in the past was Filipino martial arts teachers was teaching us these Kali counters to the jab and all this stuff. And I'm like, dude, that's not, that's not going to happen towards against my boxing coach <laughs> my boxing coach worked that jab dude he had strategy and tactics behind that jab that my collie teacher at the time he didn't he didn't have those things so um you know my time in savat my time in you know jkd you know that's jkd for me was awesome because it was like a big seminar you know? it introduced me to all these other styles and arts and at the school that I was teaching, you know, training and teaching at, we got a lot of people that came into the, that school that had these amazing backgrounds in those arts. So we had a guy that came in. He was very proficient in Savat. Uh, Roy Harris was also, is also very proficient in Savat. So I got some Savat training from him. I don't say, I never say I was a Savat practitioner or that I was a boxing practitioner or a fencing practitioner or a BJJ practitioner. I trained a lot of those things so I could understand those things and then bring them back into my game. You know, kind of like a jack of all trades at that time. I already knew what I wanted to focus on. I knew Kali was my thing. 
you know? So, um, that was, that was just my, my go-to. That was my bread and butter was Kali. But I knew that I needed to understand these other aspects to it. So they, they all play their part. I am a Arnis fighter here in the Philippines. I'm your big fan. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. I always, I always appreciate uh, the people from the Philippines that, that support, you know, support me and Kali Center. Um, you know, in, in America, we, at this time, we like to have this, uh, you know, this divide of racism. So I, I don't really believe in that stuff or I don't care about that stuff as far as when it's being thrown at me. But, you know, I would say my most race stuff against me comes from the Philippines. So I get, I get a lot of Filipinos that, you know, will say that, because I'm American, you know, I shouldn't be teaching Filipino martial arts or I can never do it the correct way or whatever because I'm not Filipino. I'm not in the Philippines. Or I have people that, you know, that used to live in, in the States that moved to the Philippines and they're like, well, you're not doing stuff right because I don't live in the Philippines. So when I, when I have people from the motherland of Kali come on and, and say there's support for what we're doing here at Kali Center, I really appreciate that because... That's really the only place that I get the other side of it as well, you know. I guess that's pretty typical in, in martial arts. People have their pride in martial arts and all that stuff. But uh, that's why, like, I, I super, I super, super appreciate, you know, when you, uh, when you uh, send me that kind of love and support from, from the Philippines. Can Kali win against Thai? That's, that's a, can Kali survive UFC? That, those are stupid questions. Can UFC survive the battlefield that Kali is used on today in Southern Philippines? That's stupid, man. That's, that's such a stupid, stupid question. Can, uh, can, can a UFC fighter come here and survive against how we train with live blades and multiple opponents? Would they be able to survive that if that was a real doubt about using their MMA skills alone? That's stupid, man. That's like, that's, that's the dumbest. That's like trying to sit there and say, you know, can, can a, a history teacher, are they going to be able to survive a, a math contest, a math of speed? Can a, can a chess, a, a checkers player survive against a, a master at chess? That's, that's so stupid. To even, to even think that way, to even think that way tells me how low your intelligence level is your IQ has got to be somewhere below 80 I would guess when you're when you're making like that's just it's so illogical you know that's like that's that is the most beginner question like the people that ask me that question in in real life are people that have never even trained yet those are the people that ask me like they're not even beginners yet like they never even put time into that. People that actually train and actually have put some time into it, maybe they had that question before they actually like get to training, but that question is immediately erased. It's immediately done and smashed the moment that they start to train, dude. Like you're, you're, you're talking about skills. That's like, is a UFC guy who has no carpentry skills at all going to be really good at building a, a freaking skyscraper in a city even though he's got no engineering no engineering at all but you know he he can he can build a freaking skyscraper because he does well in ufc or he does well in, in thai boxing that's like that's that that's the stupidest way to think that's like the lowest level of the low that you can possibly think that's like you know you know what's below all this topsoil here? Crap. Crap you can't plant and grow in. And those types of like comments, guys, it's it's way, 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 way down there. So below anything that is useful in your life. Complete, complete crap. Like, don't waste your time on stupid, on stupid questions like that. That's absolutely, absolutely a waste of your time. 
Any art can improve your eyes, your ability to know what you see, understand it, and translate it into your body. Yep. Are you studying other things that are not martial arts to improve your martial arts? Yeah, I didn't improve my grappling. The Dumog I did was also not the best, but Kali definitely improved my strikes and footwork to some degree. Yeah. So it's just vice versa, right? I mean, you got to look at at the end of, at the end of the day, I like how uh, how my buddy Jake said it. We're all humans fighting humans, right? We're all anatomically going to be able to do relatively the same things, right? We're going to punch we're going to hack with our forearms, we're going to elbow, we're going to knee, we're going to headbutt, we're going to kick with our shins, kick with our feet. We're going to grapple the same way, right? An underhook is just going to be more superior than an overhook. Doesn't matter what grappling style that you're doing. You could be doing judo, you could be doing Brazilian jiu-jitsu, you could be doing pancration, you could be doing sambo. It doesn't matter. You could be doing Roman Greco wrestling. It doesn't matter. An underhook is going to be a more superior position than an overhook. You could be doing MMA. It doesn't matter. That's just the physicality of being human and fighting human to human. So it, it, it's not a matter of is that martial art functional or not. It's a matter of are you functional? Are you able to do it? it come, it's not a, a, a question of art to art. It's a question of individual versus individual. Okay. There are moments in history like Alexander the Great. How did he march out with you know 30,000 troops? and go be undefeated in seven major battles that our military is still studying his tactics and all that today to make our military better today, right? Like, that was an individual base, dude. And he still lost a lot of great fighters. I talked about this the other night on my, uh, on my other, on my Facebook stuff. I'm like, the Battle of Tyr, when he took the island of Tyr, like people don't even know this history and everything. It didn't happen in a day. It took seven months for him to take that island to figure out how just to get to the wall. Then he scaled the wall. And then he was cut in the thigh with a sword. And he was speared while he was himself going over the wall. So, but he, he still won. So it was functional. Maybe it wasn't as functional as it, you know, as us martial artists like to believe that we are untouchable. And we're going to, I don't know, dude. Can that MMA guy, can, can that UFC guy, can, can he survive getting his thigh slashed open with a sword and getting a freaking spear through his torso? Is he going to be able to keep fighting after that like Alexander the Great did? Alexander the Great was my size, right? He was like five foot six, 140 pounds. You know, his father's greaves were at, at the field museum or at the, uh, yeah, at the field museum in Chicago. I would have fit in, his, in King Philip's greaves. Like, so just, just because like that art, you know, just because a Thai boxer can kick hard, but is he going to be able to keep fighting like Alexander the Great after he took a spear and a sword while trying to climb a fucking wall and then fighting, right? That's an individual basis, not a martial art basis. So you can't compare those things. It was a long road for the transformation of all the Japanese culture, battlefield, arts that changed into arts. I have a lot to say about the road from Jitsu to Do. Yeah, dude, there, there, there was. And there still is, man. Like, we're, we're, we're still going through the same evolutionary process in martial arts that we did this entire time. You know, the, these people talk about martial arts as, like, UFC. No, guys, today's martial arts is our, is our militaries fighting at war with each other. That's the martial arts of today. N UFC is like, and boxing and these sports would be comparison to like the gladiators during the time of Rome. But then you had these people called the Roman military. And those guys were roaming around the rest of the freaking world at that time, fighting people. And there was a different stake at hand. Most gladiator fights did not end in death. That's a misconception. People do not know the reality of history. The vast majority of them did not end in death. Okay? The vast majority, and not all the gladiators were slaves. The glad, gladiator was also a profession just like UFC is today. 
So it was a way for them to go in and make money and make a living for themselves and put food on their family's tables. It, it was not, not what we think and glorify it to be. It's like the history of the Spartans. People actually believe that Spartans were so brutal in battle that they were not allowed to compete in the Olympics. Guys, this is complete bullshit. The Spartans did very, very well in the Olympics. Okay, go look up your freaking history. If you got a cell phone in your hand, you got it in your hand. The Spartans did very well in, in the Olympics. In fact, they did very well in the chariot races. That's where they actually performed the best, was in chariot races. There was only one year that the Spartans were not allowed to participate in the Olympics, and that was in 420 BC. And the reason why was not because of their brutalness in combat, it's because they violated the Olympic peace treaty two weeks before the Olympics. That's why they weren't allowed to compete. Had nothing to do with all these things that people are making up about the Spartans being these brutal, brutal fighters. First of all, you know how many like friendly fire kills were happening in the phalanx of the Spartans? How many frontliners were getting speared from the people behind them? I mean, it was not the most intelligent design of a phalanx. That's why the Romans fixed those problems. I mean, <laughs> that's why Alexander the Great when he was out conquering the fucking known world and the Spartans were causing issues back at home, he sent his first general, who he left behind in Macedonia, to go clean up the mess of the Spartans. And Alexander the Great's first general destroyed the Spartans, dude. He just, I mean, it was like, it, it was like swatting a freaking ant on the ground, dude. So all those things, when you hear those things, guys, people claiming that they know history, you gotta go. You gotta actually go do your diligence and go look it up and go find out the facts. Don't spread the bullshit, man. Because then you're just a sucker and you're just learning how to be a sucker. So martial arts today, the real martial arts today that is being evolved, is the military, not us civilians. This is this is just recreational. This is this is for fun. And maybe you'll have to use it to defend your life one day. Maybe you want to go and be a competitor and be a, a modern day gladiator. But dude, you are not a freaking warrior. You are not volunteering your time to go across the seas and go actually put your life at stake, your life on the line. You're not a martial warrior unless you are in the military and you are fighting and serving your country. That is the real martial arts and the evolution of these martial arts today. You got to be realistic about it. Do I have black belts and other martial arts that I trained? Uh, not all martial arts give away belts, Sam. Did you know that? Do you know that not all martial arts give away belts? Did you know that? I mean, how old are you, dude? Are you new to the martial arts world? You sound like you're brand new. Maybe you're just trying to learn. I don't know. Can Kali sticks be used to self-defense against ISIS? No, you probably want some napalm. You probably want to bring in the Air Force. You know? You need some uh, some bomb experts to detect all their improvised explosive you know, devices. Their IEDs. Kali works in the battlefield. I mean, you know, the Philippine uh, Force Recon Marines are using that pretty fucking well. I... I have not seen a UFC fighter going and using MMA skills in war. I haven't seen anybody going out there to go, uh, you know, go tie kick uh, the enemy who's shooting at them with, uh, you know, AK-47s and M-16s and shit. I saw Kali Sticks in Call of Duty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> can Cadillacs fight against Hugo? Right. You know, come on, man. It's like, that, that, that's like, dude, man, that, that car is, is going to survive a head-on wreck with a fucking train. That's so stupid, dude. I met MMA practitioners that have respect for Kali, and I even saw MMA YouTubers that reference it in good light. Yeah, so, you know, th there's a... There's a con where, where the debate comes in is that, you know, most UFC fighters have not... First of all, Kali is not really well known yet. It is growing. 
But, you know, UFC fighters you, and MMA fighters, you guys got to remember that these, these guys are, are training for specific conditions, okay? They have their conditions in the cage. When Mark Denny tried to get the Dog Brothers in UFC, Dana White was like, no way. That is way too violent. We can't put that on television. Uh, the world's not ready for that level of violence in martial arts. So Kali was denied. We were denied in UFC. They don't want weapons in UFC. They don't want multiple opponents in UFC because it's, it's, it doesn't work for their viewers. They know it's not going to work. People don't want to see that. Right? There's a reason why they're not doing it how they did in you know, gladiator days. It's it's too much for people nowadays, dude. Like it's just not it's it's not gonna work. You gotta you gotta be careful how you televise things nowadays. You know you can't have those those graphics. So you can go on Dog Brothers website and you can read the letter and everything that that Dana sent back to Mark. He's got it all posted on there and everything. But uh, you know it was tried, man. It was tried. The fighters didn't want that. The UFC fighters and MMA fighters and stuff they, they didn't want weapons to to come into the cage. Because it brings a whole nother realm of risk. It brings a whole nother, it's just a whole different world. You know, I mean, how many people are going to want to grapple, you know, one against three in the ring, or in the cage? Like, it just doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't happen. Like, these people don't want to do that. So it's, you no, know, they're training for a specific condition. You know, Muay Thai, Muay Thai was the empty hand art of Krabi Krabong. Krabi Krabong is the weaponry system, the blade weaponry system of Thailand. And that was the system that they went to war with, not Muay Thai. They didn't go to war with Muay Thai. They went to war with Krabi Krabong. And Muay Thai was the backup system if you lost your weapon. Then you may have to Muay Thai your way to another weapon. That was the purpose of Muay Thai. So you can't sit there and say, is a Muay Thai fighter going to do very well against a Krabi fighter? Because the Krabi fighter's got weapons, dude. It's a whole nother world. So if you want to strip this person down of that has made their profession in weaponry and you want to strip them down into that profession or into those conditions of that other person, I'm not going to, I can't outbox my boxing coach. He, he's made boxing his profession. But now when I bring knives to that, that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother thing. So you, you bring a collie practitioner that has made, you know, now, a lot of UFC people that have started implementing Kali into their training, they're looking at Kali for specific reasons to fit the conditions of their game. So most of the time when it comes to Kali, they're looking for footwork. They're looking for different ways and new ways to navigate the terrain within the cage. That's what they're looking for or in the ring. You know, that's what they're looking for from Kali. Kali's a weapon art. It's not a weapon-based art. It's a weapon fighting art. That's like, is a fencer going to do well in the cage? It's so stupid. Is that UFC gonna, fighter going to do well on the strip? Does he even know how to handle a foil, an epe, or a saber? Does he have the athleticism that has been developed to perform on the strip? That's stupid, man. Be careful with that stuff. So not, every, not everything has, has belts, dude. I just need to say thanks so much for your teachings, man. Really makes a difference in these days. What with social distancing and reduced social interactions and all. Yeah, dude, it, it is. Yeah, I mean, thank you, man. I appreciate that and everything. And uh, we got to do what we can, man. Solo training has never been more important, right? All those people that have put me down in the past, solo training, waste of time. You can't do anything. Well, now you're stuck solo training if you want to do it. <laughs> 